<coughs> my name is Serafim, and I come from the Isle of Iona. Um, I am the spiritual father and the abbot of a monastery of monks on Iona, and the spiritual father of a monastery of sisters on the Isle of Mull, which is just across the pond, really, from Iona. Ooh, Father Stephen told me to use my church voice. The problem with my church voice is that it's the same voice I always have. I don't have what he has. The first time I heard him in the altar, I thought, God is striking me down from heavens with some sort of thunder. But no, it was just Father Steve. Uh. Every time I travel, and I have to do this homily, I feel this enormous pressure on my heart, which probably I shouldn't feel, but I do, that I somehow manage to make a connection with you. And I have about 10, maybe 15 minutes to do so. It is probably the first time I'm going to see you, and probably the last time I'm going to see you, unless you come to visit us in the islands of Scotland. And I do not want to stand before Christ in the day of my judgment. And I don't want to hear him ask me, you've had them before you for 10 minutes. And instead of being perfectly honest and vulnerable before them, and instead of trying to tell them something of my love, the love I've given you, you've put on a mask or you've put on a show and you fail to touch them. And so every time I have to do this, I never prepare beforehand. I just pray to the best of my ability that God gives me a word, and also that he multiplies that word in your own hearts. Because as I was telling them yesterday at the retreat, I do not know you, but he does. He created every single one of you, and he created you in love, with only one purpose, to save you and to be one with you in eternity. So he knows you and he knows your needs, whereas I don't. So I ask a word from him. And in many ways what I've received during this divine liturgy is what I've just told you. This gospel we've just heard is very much about putting on a show it is very much about masks and allowing us to wear these masks for so long in our lives that we end up believing that indeed we are that. That that mask we've worn initially because we are afraid or because we were ambitious or because we were envious, because of a passion basically, we end up, if we wear it long enough, we end up believing that we are more than your profession. Do not allow your profession to define who you are. If you are a mother or a father, or a sister or a child, that is a blessing, but you are so much more than someone's wife or someone's husband, someone's mother or someone's child. You are God's creature, created in His image with the only purpose that you and Christ would be one in eternity. And I'm aware because here I am wearing vestments that belong to the clergy, and here I am delivering a homily which is proper to the clergy. I'm aware how much easier it is to fall into that and to play the role of a clergy and to deliver the homily that is expected of you to prepare it beforehand so I look right before you, so I look smart and strong before you. But if I were to do that, I would fall in the trap. I pray none of us falls. I would, sooner or later, end up believing these vestments and believing this position before all of you, and I would become not a priest, but the mask of a priest, with a very small, sinful man hidden behind it. Try to remain who you are. Try to struggle through your life so that you are who you are at the end of your lives. Your profession, whatever you may be, 
or your position in this society, whatever that position may be, they are tools given to you. They are not you. They are not who you are going to be in eternity. There are so many things one can say about the gospel you read today, but for me this is the central thing. The fact that you have two people put behind before us by Christ, and one of them is simply a rich man. One rich man. He has no name. He has no identity before Christ. And he is just one of many. He is a rich man, nothing else. And on the other hand, you have Lazarus, who is poor. But he is Lazarus. He has an identity before Christ. Christ can call him by name. He is indeed who God created him to be. Whereas the rich man is defined by his richness. And this is something that I have struggled all my life not to allow to happen to myself or to those whom I love in Christ, in my community or the people I know in confession. And this is what I pass on to you as well. Don't allow your world, don't allow the world to define who you are. Because even if you are the best lawyer or the best accountant or the best teacher, the best mother or father, or wife, sooner or later, that identity is going to be folded like a tent. And at the edge of your tomb, none of that will travel with you in eternity. In many ways, this is not about being rich or being poor, because we have so many stories about rich people in the gospel who were saved. David, the prophet, was a very rich man. He was the king. But he was rich in a different way, in a merciful way, in a repentant way. We know that he watered his bed with tears in prayer and repentance every single night. And Christ himself, just a bit earlier in the gospel, gives us another example of a rich man, the one who wastes his master's wealth, the one who knows that his time is up, and instead of playing the game he's played all his life and dying being just his master's you know, accountant or whatever he was, he actually wastes that wealth. And he befriends everyone by wasting that wealth. And what happens? Because of his merciful heart, God praises him. So you have wealth as a tool that can save you or can crush you. This is not about wealth or about being poor, because there are also many poor people who found their way not into heavens but into hell. But Lazarus, just think about him. Lazarus was a poor man, was also very sick because he was lying at the gates of the rich man. And yet, I don't know about you, but if I'm sick, or if I lack something, I immediately begin to complain. Maybe not out loud, but in my heart. Why is this happening to me, out of all the people? Why is this not happening to the other guy? Because look, I'm doing all these things, and God should repay me with a better life. And instead, that person over there does nothing good, and everything good happens to him. All this anger, all this envy, all this why me happens almost automatically to all of us and it is a very difficult thing to defeat in our hearts. But Lazarus has none of this. Lazarus simply waits. He doesn't complain, he doesn't accuse. He does not accuse the rich man, he does not accuse God. He just waits in humility, and in patience. And for that humility and patience of his, although his life was so harsh, God repays him with eternal life. This is a story about identity, about either being who we are before God, or allowing the world and our passions to define who we are, and ending up being no one 
before God himself. But it is also a story that tells us something about spiritual wealth, not only physical wealth. Because look at us today. In many ways, we are the rich men, all of us here. Look at the wealth we have. And I don't mean the material wealth. Look at these icons, not at their value, but at their truth. We have the truth of the faith. We have the truth of Christ. There were so many of you receiving communion today, and that is such a blessed thing to see. I am so grateful to God that, that His Eminence is blessing you to receive and encouraging you to receive, because it is that way that we find out who we are. But as rich as we are, as soon as we leave, the gates of this house, of this church, at our gates lies a world filled with Lazaruses. Poor men, not only physically and materially, but in terms of their spiritual life. God has given us everything. And that is an immense gift but at the same time, an immense responsibility. Don't think that when the time comes, we are not going to be asked about how we have administered all the wealth that we were given. Leave aside for a moment your material wealth and think about the spiritual wealth you have. It is very common for us to feel that this was given to us and to us alone. But the truth is that every single human being out there was created by the same loving God that we were created and for the same reason, so that we are saved and we become one with Him in eternity. You've received everything today when you received communion. No amount of wealth, no amount of knowledge, no amount of praise, can be more than having in yourselves God himself. And as his eminence and the fathers came to you, calling you and saying with fear of God and with faith and love draw near with their chalices, you have become chalices yourselves because the body and the blood of Christ passed on from these material chalices into you. And now you are going to go out. You are going to leave this house of the Lord. And you are going to enter into this world that's filled with spiritually ill, spiritually paralyzed, call them what we want, people lying down in their sinfulness. And you are going to be these walking chalices in this paralyzed world. And it is up to you to share with them the crumbs of the wealth that you are given. It is so easy to be righteous. It is so easy to be condemning and judgmental in the world in which we live. But don't be, my beloved ones, because if we are, we end up paralyzing our own hearts. We end up being just one rich man or one rich woman, spiritually speaking. And in fact, we've done nothing. Because all the wealth we are given, we are given it so we can share it. Not only the material wealth, but also the spiritual one. And have no doubt, no doubt that for your love and for your faith, Christ can give life to this world. Remember a different parable, the one with the friends that bring the paralyzed man before Christ and they break the roof of the house so they can descend him just before God. And God heals him. Why? Because he was paralyzed. He wasn't able to say anything. He couldn't say, I believe in you. He couldn't say, help me. He couldn't do any gesture. He was a paralyzed man like the paralyzed world that surrounds us. But Christ says, for their faith, 
Walk up. Get up and walk. Not for his faith, not for anything he's done, but for their faith. And the real miracle here is not that that paralyzed actually stands up and walks, but that in manifesting their love for someone who was completely paralyzed, those four friends of his found their salvation. Have no doubt those four friends of the paralyzed man shine brightly in heaven. This is what I want to leave you with. You are rich people spiritually. For some reason that God alone knows, he has chosen every single one of you and he has given you everything that is necessary for your salvation. That comes with immense responsibility. You've done nothing to deserve it. It's all for his love. Don't go out and spread judgment and condemnation. Go out and be what God has done for you. Be what he has been for you. Be a chalice in this world. Bring Christ's body and his blood, which you carry in your bodies in this paralyzed world. And whether they know it or not, their hearts will know they will respond to his presence. The more you love, the more you share, the more you waste, and I stress that word, the more you waste, the brighter you shine, my beloved ones. Thank you for having me today and yesterday, and thank you, Father Steve, and thank you, Your Eminence, for all your kindness and all your generosity towards me. May God bless us all. So all you deacon can't, oh, forget that. Say so.